I think people, you know, men and women still aren't quite used to women having public platforms and opinions. It's still triggering in some way to people. Hi, I'm Nick and I'm joined by Marina for the latest in Enemies in Conversation series. How's it going today? I'm pretty good. Just, um, you know, surviving this LA rain. <laughs> How long have you been in LA for? Like, when did you move there? Um, I moved, well, I, I did part-time for about two years and then I moved here mid-pandemic properly. And how was that? Great, <laughs> in some ways. Um, I'd wanted to move out here for quite a long time. So yeah, it felt like a relief in some ways. I mean, I'd lived in London for 15 years, so I really needed to change. But, you know, it's always, you know, it's strange doing big things in a pandemic and making big decisions. Does it feel like home now? Do you feel kind of settled? Yeah, I do, because a lot of my friends are out here, like people who I've known for 10, 12 years. Um, a lot of people from New York and London moved here. So oddly it does, but it took a very long time. Like it took me a good eight years to realize that, <laughs> that LA is an amazing city and that I didn't really know a lot about it from my work trips. It feels like maybe in the last, over that kind of eight year period, it's become the place where like a lot of kind of songwriters and producers are. It feels like the music industry's kind of gravitated there. Did that kind of, yeah. like your decision to move there, the fact it feels like there's a lot of kind of music infrastructure there. Yeah, absolutely. There's a huge creative community here and some of those people are my friends. So it felt like a very natural move as well. And I, well, having heard the album, I feel like living in America has definitely informed a lot of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's called Ancient Dreams in the Modern Land. What, um, what inspired the title? Actually a book review by the LA Times. <laughs> in, that was like from 1988. <laughs> Weird, right? Um, yeah, it, I was reading this book on uh, Kyoto and it wasn't exactly um, the album title, but it was a similar phrase. And I loved the kind of imagery that it evoked. It was kind of like trying to connect the past with the present. And I think, you know, COVID aside, I think the way that technology has developed and, and social media, socializing has changed in the past 10 years so dramatically. I feel like humans are trying to still catch up. And so I was drawn to that title for that reason, because I'm always trying to blend, um, you know, history in the past with what I feel is the future. Mm. It feels like this album is perhaps your most political today. Was that inspired by creating during the pandemic? Is that why you kind of were drawn to those themes? Or do you think you would have made an album that felt quite political anyway? I think it would have been political, some kind of social commentary, but, you know, we've seen like an explosion of all of these social problems that have been building for years and years, and they've always existed, but some of us, including myself, have not really had um, awareness of them or like a full understanding. And it's impossible not to be affected by life events and to let that, you know, influence your music. So I think it is more of a political, socio-political album than usual, but I think I've always written in that way anyway. Like even with Hollywood or like, oh no, those were still socio-political, but they were wrapped in like a nice bow. So people didn't realize it. <laughs> I feel like you can definitely draw a through line from Hollywood to, you know, something like New America on this album. And one of the things I love about the songs in this album is like how you've really put in specific cultural references. Cause obviously you can definitely write a really good political song that couches things in slightly more kind of vague terms. But for example, like um, you've got Harvey Weinstein and Britney Spears mentioned uh, on Pose to Poison. And mm. um, on Man's World, you kind of allude really specifically to the fact that uh, Beverly Hills Hotel is owned by the Sultan of Brunei, who's responsible for the deaths of like thousands of gay men. I was wondering like, when you were writing the album, did you think like, I really want to go in there and put in really specific references so that there's kind of no doubt what I'm writing about here? No, not really. It's never that conscious when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. It's more, um, I'm trying to encapsulate a feeling or a moment in time. And, you know, 
Purge of Poison is all over the place. Part of me is like, whoa, none of the lyrics connect. <laughs> it's total stream of consciousness. But then when I think about it and I can t step back from it, I do see that they are all interconnected um, topics. But hopefully, you know, listeners get that feeling that it's like encapsulates a snapshot in time for us. And we can all now see how much things have changed in a really positive way. Is it hard to get those kind of lines to scan when they are like, you know, people's names? <laughs> Is it make more work for you? <laughs> when you say scan, do you mean saying? <laughs> no, I mean, like, so that, you know, to make them kind of rhyme neatly and, um, and oh, to make them sing, sing more for you, I guess. Yeah, I don't know, Nick. I think, um, again, it's not that conscious at the time. It's just like, blah. <laughs> <laughs> and you you kind of like try and piece things together. I don't, I can never remember actually like writing the song that much because you just go into like, I don't know, another part of yourself that's not fully conscious. Are you very prolific? Like, can you write a song kind of every day if you were in a creative space? I think I could write a song a day. Do I want to? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not because I, the reason my songs are so kind of saturated is is because I'm collecting ideas over a long period of time. Like each album, I probably only write 15 songs, which is quite a small number. Yeah, because often you hear artists say that they, oh, you know, I had 40 songs this album, maybe they weren't all finished, but in some form, and then they whittled yeah. it down. It's really interesting that you don't do that. Yeah, I think, I think it's incredible that some artists can write so much material, but I think also they might have different aims. Like they might be looking for this perfect pop hook that's potentially going to get on radio or, you know, going to lead to commercial success. Whereas for me, I do feel like that ship has sailed. <laughs> and in a positive way, I feel like, you know, I've had those moments, but as an artist, that's not really what excites me anymore. It's more like, what am I interested in at the time? And what do I want to explore, like, in myself? What What's going on? What do I have issues with in my own thinking? If you're writing in that kind of stream, conscious, stream of consciousness way, how do you know when a song's finished? Because I guess you could leave it super raw and super consciousness, or you could kind of polish it a bit. So do you kind of know? Is it a gut feeling that you know when something's right? Yeah. Yeah, because I'll usually write the first draft and then... Um, I'll like transfer it to my phone. I go for a walk and I can immediately sense like the stuff that bugs me. So I'll note it down and, and I'll do that about three or four times until it feels um, listenable to me. And then, <laughs> and then I usually get a feeling that, yeah, this feels right to me. It's like with this album in particular, were you thinking like, I want to write a song that's about patriarchy or was it just that in that creative moment, that's what came out. No, yeah, I, I never think about um, making like statements before I'm writing. It's more just feelings that I have. Like Man's World was written a, a while ago now, almost two years ago. Um, and, you know, obviously those issues have been around for ages. So um, that's something that's built in me over time. And, and now I feel like I have the words to articulate it and also I feel like it'll be received um in a different way compared to if I'd written it 10 years ago like I would have gotten a very different reaction they would have been like who does she think she is <laughs> now it's um you know people get it we've had a cultural shift how um how has the response been to that song obviously there's been a cultural shift has, this, has there been any negativity though um, I mean, cultural shift, not in regard to the song. I mean, just in, you know, mm. in regard to how people think about this topic now. Um, in terms of response, I've had a very good response, but the thing is I don't go like, like trawling the internet anymore. So I don't really know what people who dislike me think <laughs> or people who um, may not even know of my music. They might just see the title and feel that it's inflammatory and then go check the song out. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's like, there's definitely been comments on YouTube that are opposed to the song. There's always gonna be that when you're expressing any kind of opinion, particularly a political one. 
And I think particularly as a female artist. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely that layer of complexity as well, which I don't know about you, but I'm like, God, I'm just, it feels so heavy and like, it's, I'm just like tired of even meant having to mention it anymore. But yeah, it is definitely a factor. I think, I think people, you know, men and women still quite, aren't quite used to women having public platforms and opinions. It's still triggering in some way to people. I think it, it, that's so evident in the way sometimes women who do have a public platform and do express opinions are, are spoken about, you know, there's words used that don't tend to get, you know, attached to men, like, you know, like fiery, things like that, whereas actually maybe it's just expressing an opinion. Yeah, yeah, we still have some evolving to do there, but I think it, it is getting better. I think, you know, even the conversations about online hate, which just seems to be everywhere now, no matter what gender you are, looking at the reasons behind why people target other people in that way, is, I don't know, it kind of like lessens its power. Like I know that shame is a really easy tool to use to get people to shut up basically. <laughs> and I'm not saying that, you know, some people aren't annoying sometimes. I might be annoying to people, but I don't want my being female to be a part of that. At what point did you realize that you didn't want to go looking for what people were saying about you online? At what point in your career did that kind of dawn on you? Uh, probably about two and a half years ago. Yeah, I wish I'd decided that a lot sooner because I've got so much more peace back in my mind again. <laughs> like, and also, I think it's fortunate that I've I've even decided it so late because I think hate has gotten worse and worse over the years. I don't know how you feel because you must see a lot of it as well in fandoms and and in your own work. Um, yeah, I've been interviewing um, another artist for this same for Enemy in Conversation series last week, Slater. And oh, yeah. she's very, very much a kind of product of, you know, what people would call like Stan Twitter. And I think what was really interesting talking to her is um, this kind of slightly new pheno phenomenon, maybe in the last two or three years, where Stans are kind of hypercritical of the artist that they love. Like, you know, she, she was pointing out that if, if she does a photo shoot and they don't like her hair in it or they don't the way the way she looks, she gets criticised for that. Now, that's quite quite alien to me because I come from a place where, like, the pop stars who I idolised growing up, the Spice Girls, like, I, they couldn't do any wrong. Like, I would never <laughs> say, like, criticising what Jerry was wearing or something. So to me, that's really bizarre that these stands have this kind of ownership over the artist where if they don't, if the artist doesn't do something the way they want the artist to do it, they get like kind of slated for it. I find that really hard. To yeah, it, yeah, it is confusing. I'm still not fully understanding it, but actually you asked me a minute ago, when did I start like, or stop trawling the internet? And I actually think it was a lot longer ago. It was after Fruit because I think I really had a desire to change and like grow out of my, I don't know, this feeling that I was like locked in a persona or like locked to my artist identity. And I, obviously got like a reaction from my fan base, which is understandable. But I think because of the internet and the close proximity people feel to an artist, they also feel that they do have ownership. And I had to say no to that for obvious reasons. Like I was a 30 year old woman at the time mm. and people are gonna change. And yes, yeah, some, some part of the fan base might not like it, but then, you know, that's the way that music shifts and moves. Um, you can't stop yourself doing that just to please other people. When when you announced that you were dropping um, or transitioning from Marina and the Diamonds to Marina, was that part was that part of the the thing that some fans found hard to kind of get hard to take? Yeah, I think so, and understandably because I'd built this amazing like unique community around that name. Um, but I'd also done it for 10 years. And like I said, I just, I think I just felt so stuck at the time. I felt, I don't know, weirdly locked in this like smiley, happy persona that couldn't show any other side of myself. And that's so frustrating for anybody to not feel integrated, like your public self and your personal self is so separate that you only feel yourself when you're on your own. Like, <laughs> it, and I've spent many years feeling like that. Um, so I just 
decided that like I had to make some changes and I thought anything that's going to make me feel more authentic and more relaxed is a positive thing and I knew that the name was part of that. And did it instantly feel like you'd kind of shed this baggage? Did it feel liberating? Yeah, it really did, actually. It really worked. Um, I don't know how fans today feel about it. <laughs> Hopefully they've accepted it. But um, yeah, I had to do that just for personal reasons. Yeah, no, it sounds like, I mean, if you're at the point where you feel like you're locked into playing a role, that can't be healthy for you as a person or as a, an artist. Yeah, for sure. Well, a couple of years ago, uh, you tweeted that you were looking for female collaborators for your latest project. Mm. Um, and I was wondering, did you find that people flocked you saying, yes, I really want to work for you? Or was it actually quite hard to find female collaborators? I think the statistic, which is woeful, is that like 10% mm. of producers are women, 3% uh, of engineers, which is, I mean, it, it's, in, it's insulting. Um, so when you kind of put it out there that you wanted to work with more women, did, were you inundated or was it the case that there aren't because they haven't had the opportunities, there aren't that many women out there who could work with you. Well, it was, so it was a call for create for like female creatives, which included producers, um, video directors, and photographers. But I definitely was inundated. Yeah, again, not so many producers, but there were uh, people and there were artists reaching out as well. So I should do that again because I got so many good suggestions and I pretty much assembled like the whole creative team. My my photo album, my photo album, my photo shoot, my album cover would look completely different if my fans hadn't sent me coughs who who ended up shooting it. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of thing's really useful. It's amazing that it kind of affected things in that way. Like it kind of gave you an instant boost. Yeah. What was yeah. it, you have worked with a female producer on this album, uh, Jennifer Del Silvio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, I um, interviewed Beth Ditto a few years ago, and Jennifer produced her solo album. And she said to me, uh, Beth Ditto, uh, in the interview, that one of, I think, the male engineer in the session had said to her afterwards, do you know what, it was so refreshing working with a female producer, because it just changed the whole atmosphere in the room, the kind of, the kind of machismo and the kind of, like, getting your balls out, metaphorically. Right. <laughs> My guys in the room, he just, he said that he found it very refreshing, which I thought was so interesting. I was wondering, did you find it, it kind of changed, changed things creatively, having more feminine energy in the room? Yes. Yeah, it always does. And even on tour, um, a lot of, you know, crew members who I've worked with have said they always prefer having, you know, like an equal number of women on tour to men, because that's a sample of society and it's, just feels more natural but in the studio in particular because it's such a vulnerable space and there are just there are so many instances I've been in the room and have not really felt like I could express my opinion either because of lack of experience or just because I it would have really helped to have other women there um it's not really like the men who I worked with's fault it was just sometimes that's how it is and and no one really thought of you know it being any other way at the time or at least I didn't um you know when I started out in this industry but yeah Jen is amazing and I hope by talking about it we can inspire other women that this is a viable career option and that um you know you don't you know you don't need to like even with artists you don't need to be super techie to like produce your own demos I produce on my own now I, and I have since the start um they're very rough but like they really inform the final sound of the record and we end up using stuff off my demos and like if honestly if I can do it other female artists can do it because I just I don't know I don't I don't usually spend loads of time like learning new software and stuff like that new plugins um so yeah I, I do feel anyone can do it in a basic way if they need to Feels like maybe in the last um, two or three years, like up and coming female artists who are producing on in some level are feeling more comfortable asking for like a co-producer credit where maybe they wouldn't have been able to do that or, or felt comfortable enough to do that 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's something that should be talked about a bit more because I think you have to ascertain like what co-production actually means. And for me, Part of it means when we use stuff from my original demos or we pretty much replicate, but in a more professional way, 
the the parts that I've come up with on my own and the synths and stuff like that that I've chosen. Um, and then the other part of co-production is actually being in the room and guiding the session and directing the producer. So, you know, I would never um, suppose that I have the same knowledge or, or even skill level as any of the producers I've worked with, but I contribute in a way that is significant and that changes the, the, the whole sound of the record and the whole direction of it. Yeah, and when you do that, you deserve a credit. It's as simple as that. Absolutely, yeah. Or, you know, if they use stuff off your demo, but you don't do anything when you're actually in the session, then you can always ask for additional production credit. How, how much better do you think the industry has got in the, I mean, the debut album's 11 years old, but you were working in the industry before then. Like how much better has the industry got at sort of supporting female creative, do you think? Do you think much, I mean, that stat is woeful, but do you think things have got slightly better in that time? You know what, Nick, I don't. I think one thing that record labels could really do to encourage this is to not just like sign an artist who's been writing on his or her own, and then, you know, immediately put them in with co-writers, like let them develop on their own. Cause we have so few solo writers. And I always think that it's like, people come up with really interesting stuff when they write on their own. Cause there's no one to edit them and say that lyrics, you know, stupid or like that's not relatable or that's too provocative. And I think, I think we would have a really different musical landscape if we had those types of artists again. I think it, Part of the problem has been that kind of mentality of we sign this talented young artist and then we want to put them in with someone, a producer who creates hits. And that, yeah, yeah, you know. I, I get that, it's so tempting, but all, I think also you could still foster that talent and develop it or give it time to kind of bloom on its own because artists might then start to get a bit more into production if they're you know, working on their own at home before they go into this next step. Yeah, well, I guess that's kind of the, what Kate Bush had at the start of her career. She had like three years of being able to kind of hone all aspects of her artistry. Absolutely. And, which, I mean, Kate Bush is Kate Bush, but I mean... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's an excellent fair, example, though. Yeah, it's maybe not fair to hold everyone to the same bar, but like, if she hadn't have been given those three years, if they put her in with like whoever the hot producer was in the 70s, who knows how different her career would have been. Yeah, that's such a good example. She is really at the top. Um, in terms of just being an incredible producer and songwriter. I think there's also like a, I wonder if there's like a mental health aspect to this because an artist I spoke to, I interviewed a few years ago, um, who I think actually started her career at a similar time as you, said that she was put in with, you know, big producers and she wasn't confident. She was so young, she was in her teen, te late, late teens wasn't yeah. confident enough to kind of express herself in front of other, other people like that. She hadn't really worked out who she was and just found the whole thing incredibly traumatizing. Wow. Um, you think, you know, there has to be other ways of doing things. That can't be the best thing for that person as a, obviously as a person, but also as, as, a, as an artist, it can't be in the record label's interest if they're making someone freeze because they're not comfortable in that situation. Because it's very vulnerable having to go into a room and like be told, you know, write a song, write a hit. Yeah, <laughs> I've experienced that and it is, incredibly anxiety inducing. I had the worst anxiety I've ever had in my life <laughs> before I wrote Prima Donna. <laughs> because I was going in with Dr. Luke, who was like a huge, as you know, um, songwriter producer at the time. I don't know, it was hard to tell in that time whether I was so anxious because I didn't feel like this was me musically or whether um, he was just so successful and I didn't feel like I was at that level or like near that level yet. So yeah, I think sometimes maybe, maybe like it could just help for producers to know how nerve wracking it is for artists and to, to like give them space to interject or to contribute to the, um, the direction of the production. Maybe it's just awareness that it is like a very vulnerable process. Is it, is it, possible in that situation say you've been put in with a, a really big producer and mm. just let's say creatively you, you don't click at all can you just say like you know this isn't working can I leave or is that not possible because there's so, it's not hard in the session that's what I always wonder can you just say do you know what like we just don't we can't work together we just don't yeah you know what that's happened to me um 
I think that's happened only like twice. <laughs> in my I've had to leave the session. Actually, the stress was so like high on one of them that I actually cried. <laughs> I went to the bathroom. I was like, after five hours, I'd written one line. I'm, I'll actually tell you who it was because these people, I think they, they would laugh now because it's so long ago and they're both nice people. It was Benny Blanco and Dave Sitek. Um, and on paper, it was like, oh, interesting. Like this could be a really good collaboration. I just released Hollywood at the time. But in reality, I don't know what it was. Like I liked both of those guys and I, I'm still in touch with Benny. It wasn't anything personal, I just didn't work. And so you have to just say, you know, I can't do, <laughs> I can't do this. I'm gonna go and cry in the loo and then I'm gonna leave. <laughs> I guess no one told you beforehand that you could say that. No one, no. And you think, oh, you know, these people have got all these amazing things on their CV. And so you must, it's hard not to internalize and think, oh, maybe there's something wrong with me. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of, um, I think artists do it like fairly regularly. Um, yeah. There was another guy who I wrote with about four years ago and I went to his place. It was like this nice place in the hills. He was really sweet. And um, like an hour passed and I was like, okay, so we've done the kind of small talk catch up thing where we both feel comfortable, let's start. And he just did not want to start. <laughs> hour two rolls by, hour three, hour four. And I was like, I actually can't bear this anymore. I was like, shall we write something? He just kept pacing around the room and changing the topic of conversation. And I did eventually leave. And then afterwards I found out he has really bad anxiety. And he, he does that with a lot of writers. And then like the second session that you do, you might actually write something. So it's learning to navigate all these different personalities. Um, that's like a, an education in itself. Yeah, it must be to have to, you know, be as you say, your most vulnerable with people you've never met before. That's totally, cool. yeah, works on both, both ways for the songwriters too. Another song on the album that I really love, being a spy trap. I was wondering if this was kind of, I mean, maybe I'm being cheated by saying this, but is it like a kind of your, like a kind of self-empowerment song, you kind of accepting you for who you are? That's kind of how it, 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 it sounds to me, but I could be talking bollocks. No, no, you're absolutely right. I love that. Um, it's definitely self, um, it's, it's celebratory and I think context is needed for sure. Like when you listen to it, because if I, if I like listen to it and I didn't know the artist, I'd be like, like, why are they saying these things? But for myself, I've just, I've never like felt proud of what I've created and up until recently, basically. And I feel like part of that has had to do with my, just like the female experience of being an artist. I've been slated so much in my career that I always just felt like I was doing things wrong or like people hated me or, you know, didn't like what I stood for. And now I can look at it much more objectively, but I'm like, you know, I am proud for the fact that I'm on album five on the same label I signed to. I've had a career where I haven't had to compromise very much. And the most important thing is I've had creative freedom, which I'm really grateful for. Um, you know, I hope people take from that song that you don't have to be pushed into being things in order to feel like you've got security or success. Do you feel like the industry, people generally understand you better than they did like 11 years ago when the family jewels come out? Do you feel like people get who you are a bit more now? I don't know, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you tell me Nick, what the UK thinks of me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're probably I think you're probably the kind of artist who it's not easy to sum up in a very like glib and and kind of snappy way which means yeah. that if someone has been on the whole journey with you they totally get what you're about and understand the choices whereas if you say that someone came to you now and heard that song like if someone said to me like say like an alien like landed on earth and said like <laughs> about marina I wouldn't know how to describe that in an easy way but that doesn't mean that well, I get who you are I think I get who you are. quote that please in the article <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, I think also just like the way that I've bounced album to album from pop to like doing an alternative record on my own, that is a bit confusing. And you either really enjoy that pace or, you, or you're or you confused by it. 
But I would hope that after Love and Fear and now doing Ancient Dreams, that people just realize that, yeah, I have, you know, a pop writing skill set and that that doesn't make me any less authentic. What are you? What are you proudest of in your career? Is it the fact that you haven't had to compromise that much and you have been able to stand your ground? I think it's it's the ability to write exactly what I want to write about. Because with this record, you know, it wasn't like I was sending it back and forth to the label. I delivered it and they approved it and it went out. No one's ever said to me, like, you can't write this lyric or have this sound. And I feel really, you know, I feel proud of it, but I feel really grateful for that That's freedom. Yeah, that's really amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.